Order, order, please. Uh, I'd like to uh, call the meeting of the Law Amendments Committee to order. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to the legislature. The purpose of the Law Amendments Committee is to hear from the public on the current legislation that's before the House, and so uh, today we will be dealing with uh, six bills over the course of the afternoon. Uh, my name is Keith Irving. I'm uh, the MLA from King South and the Vice Chair of this committee. And so I'd like to begin by having my colleagues at the table introduce themselves, and perhaps we could begin with Ms. Chender. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Claudia Chender, MLA for Dartmouth South. Good afternoon. Susan LeBlanc, MLA for Dartmouth North. Good afternoon and welcome. Tim Hallman, MLA for Dartmouth East. Good afternoon. John Lohr, MLA for Kings North. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Benjamin Jessam, and I represent the community of Hammonds Plains, Lucasville. Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Rafa Di Costanzo, MLA for Clayton Park West. Good afternoon, everyone. Patricia Arab, MLA for Fairview Clayton Park. Good afternoon, everyone. Brendan McGuire, Halifax Atlantic. Thank you. And I'm also joined, or we are joined, uh, by Karen Kinsley to my right and Aaron Fowler and my left from Ledge Council to assist us here this afternoon. Just want to begin with a little bit of uh, housekeeping. Um, in case of an emergency, we'll exit on the Granfield door and gather at Parade Square. Uh, washrooms, public washrooms can be found down the stairs. When you reach the bottom of the stairs, uh, a U-turn to the left. Um, uh, we are governed by the rules of, uh, of the legislature in this chamber, so uh, obviously no cell phones. I'd like to ask, ask people to put their cell phones on vibrate. Um, and photos or recording uh, uh, cannot be done except for accredited uh, media. Uh, and uh, as well, uh, the gallery is asked that there be no expressions of pleasure or displeasure with the proceedings uh, during the course of the afternoon. Um, with respect to the process, uh, we, we have a list of witnesses here. There are 15 minutes allocated uh, for each witness, uh, so a presentation up to 10 minutes, and then there'll be five minutes for committee members uh, to ask questions. If you don't take the uh, uh, full uh, 10 minutes, then uh, there may be additional time for questions from committee members. I'll do my best to uh, give witnesses a heads up at about the eight minute mark to give you a sense that you have two minutes remaining. And uh, I guess finally I'd like to remind everyone to uh, wait to be acknowledged by the chair so that uh, Ledge TV can keep track of, uh, of the conversation here this afternoon. Uh, so with that, I'd like to begin uh, with bill number 193, the Massage Therapist Titles Protection Act. And is Monica Miller here? Welcome, Monica, if you could come up and take a seat at the table. I believe Ms. Miller has uh, circulated her presentation to the committee, and I just also want to note to the committee that uh, two other documents have been uh, sent in by fax. Uh, one uh, sent in, I, I can't actually read the signature, um, but it's a fax. Uh, from Evolution Massage Therapy. Uh, as well, we have a letter from Joan Weir. Uh, so those should be in front of committee members. So welcome, uh, Ms. Miller. Uh, you, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Monica Miller, and I've been a massage therapist in Nova Scotia for over 16 years. I'm also a clinic owner in Tantallon and currently serve as the chair of the investigations committee for the Massage Therapists Association of Nova Scotia. Thank you for the opportunity to speak in support of Bill 193, the Massage Therapists Titles Protection Act. In the years that I have been working in the profession of massage therapy, we have seen a substantial increase in the use of massage as an effective treatment protocol for things such as non-pharmacological pain reduction, sports injuries, post-surgical rehabilitation, workplace injury, concussion, chronic illness and disability, motor vehicle accidents, and more. More so lately in the treatment of PTSD and anxiety disorders. 
Massage therapists are often working alongside of physiotherapists, chiropractors, and mental health teams now. And we receive referrals from family medical doctors, specialists, and dentists. There are a variety of patients that we treat, ranging in age from very young children and infants to the elderly. We're assessing and treating patients with sometimes very complex health issues. And as in any healthcare profession, it is vital that massage therapists have a thorough understanding of human anatomy and physiology, as well as the disease processes that they're looking at in order to safely and effectively treat their patients. As you may be aware, there are a few professional associations in Nova Scotia who advocate for the profession of massage therapy. Until now, with the proposed bill, there has been nothing in place to protect the public from unqualified or unsafe massage therapists. I'm a graduate of a 2200 hour program, which is one of the required items in the proposed bill. And some of the most valuable and far reaching lessons I learned have been respect for persons, respecting patient boundaries and ethical care. The people I see have confidence in the care they are receiving. It is up to me as the healthcare practitioner to advise my patients what kind of treatment would be most appropriate, how frequently they will require treatment, and what the expected outcome would be. It's also my duty to advise patients when massage therapy may not be appropriate, or when modifications to treatment may be required. It's my responsibility to know what techniques should not be used in treating certain health conditions. And my patients trust me to make the best decisions in their treatment care. Having said this, there are those who work outside the scope of massage therapy, who do not join a recognized association for massage therapy advocacy because they do not meet the standards do not meet the minimum educational requirement of 2,200 hours, which is also nationally recognized as the highest standard of education in North America, who offer massage services without appropriate professional liability insurance. While we believe this population of individuals is small, it is not without risk of harm to the public. By protecting the title of massage therapist, we are ensuring that the public can have some assurances that the massage therapy care they receive is being done by people with the highest standards of practice, by people who will ensure their safe and ethical treatment and who will maintain professional boundaries. As public awareness on the health care advantages and benefits of massage grows, so does the risk of harm from unqualified practitioners. MTANS alone has seen its membership grow from slightly over 400 members when I graduated to well over 1,200 active massage therapists. Our profession is rapidly growing, and so is the public interest in seeing massage therapy regulated. It has been far too easy for far too long for just anyone to hang a sign on their door and state that they offer massage without any regulatory oversight or assurances for public safety or accountability. In my role as chair of investigations for MTANS, I oversee a committee of nine other massage therapists. We investigate complaints made by the public uh, about our members. I wanted to come here not only as a massage therapist, but in this role to place emphasis on the need for full regulation of massage therapy. It is essential that Bill 193 not only go into full effect, but that it eventually become part of a broader regulation for the profession. I would like to thank you for your time this afternoon and hearing our statements of support, as well as the Honorable Randy Delory for bringing Bill 193 forward as a vital first step in the regulation of the profession of massage therapy. Great. Thank you, Ms. Miller. Thank Any you. questions from the committee? Mr. Lohr? Um, yeah, thank you, uh, Monica, for your presentation. I guess I'm wondering what, what is it about full regulation that will be better than what this bill offers that, that makes you suggest that you want full, uh, broader regulation? Ms. Miller. Right now, the association's role is to be the advocate for the massage therapist. Um, we've done a pretty good job so far of riding the line of also protecting the public interest to a certain degree. We have an investigations committee. We do investigate complaints that are made. We have a quality assurance program and a continuing education requirement, uh, which is regularly audited. 
In a college, in a regulatory college, those functions would move laterally away from the association so that we can focus our efforts on advocating for the profession itself, and the college can focus on the, the public protection. Right now, if we receive a complaint, we are limited in the scope of what we can do. We cannot investigate things like sexual abuse or sexual assault or fraud. We can only investigate them insofar as they are violations of standards of practice. And our goal as an advocate for our members is to work with them to ensure that they meet those standards adequately moving forward. It does not protect the public from that person going elsewhere and practicing under another association or without association advocacy. So at this time, if we were to remove a person that we deemed dangerous to the public, they can simply leave and go elsewhere and practice, and there is no legal recourse unless the victim goes to the police and there is a criminal investigation. Uh, Mr. Lohr, supplementary? Yeah. So you're in favor of this bill, but you, you wanted more out of it. Is that what you're saying? Okay. Uh, Ms. Miller, just to get on the record there, your mic's now on. Oh, sure. <laughs> you can say absolutely. Oh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> it's, it's vital that this move forward, um, but it's also my personal belief that it has to be part of a broader regulation process as well. Great. Any further questions from the committee? Thank you very much, Ms. Miller. Okay, next, uh, Amy Lynn Graves, President of the Massage Therapist Association of Nova Scotia. Is Amy here? Great, thank you. Welcome, Ms. Graves. Thank you the floor for having is yours. me. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to present on Bill 193 today. My name, as you know, is Amy Lynn Graves, and I'm the president of the Massage Therapist Association of Nova Scotia. MTANS represents 1,200 massage therapists in Nova Scotia, or approximately 90% of the practitioners in the province. Massage therapy is the complementary therapy that Canadians use most frequently. Our clients include very young children and frail seniors. They are often in pain from injuries or they suffer from chronic illnesses. Trained massage therapists understand the technique that will bring relief without inflicting damage to their patients. Our patients are often the referring doctors, uh, our patients and often the referring doctors trust us to provide compassionate, effective treatment. They also trust us to respect and maintain professional boundaries. Yet we've all heard of examples where individual massage therapists have, through lack of knowledge, actually aggravated an original complaint. We've heard of massage therapists who have exploited the vulnerability of a patient. The majority of massage therapists in Nova Scotia are well trained. MTANS and other associations require approved continuing education to maintain membership. And we investigate any allegations of inappropriate or unprofessional behavior by a member. The very small number of massage therapists who do not maintain our professional standards are the concern to the majority of the MTANS members. That is why MTANS has supported self-regulation for the profession of massage therapy for so many years. We believe that Nova Scotians who are looking for a massage therapist need the security of knowing that a regulatory body is established and maintaining the, the highest professional standards. The title protection legislations are considered today is a significant step forward towards the level of public safety. It will ensure that massage therapists are well trained and that their professional knowledge is current. It will also provide the profession with a greater degree of authority to manage situations where individual practitioners have not met the standards, whether that be educational or a more serious sanction. We welcome the legislation and are looking forward to its implementation. In closing, I would like to recognize the work of the officials at the Department of Health and Wellness with MTANS and the associations. Cindy Cruikshank and Sarah Savage have kept us informed throughout every step of the process and we appreciate their cooperation and approach. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Ms. Graves. Any questions from the committee? 
No further questions. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for coming out. Uh, so we've had, uh, I think, uh, two delegations and a couple documents. I'm wondering if we could have a motion with respect to Bill Number 193, Mr. Jessam. Mr. Chair, through you, I move that Bill 193 be moved back to the House without amendment. Any discussion? All in favour, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you very much. Uh, moving now to Bill Number 201, the Municipal Government Act and the Halifax Regional Municipal Charter, Mr. John Traves. Welcome back, Mr. Traves. I, maybe we're going to have to get an assigned seat for you for law amendments. <laughs> Hope not. <laughs> um, please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Vice Chair and members of the committee. Again, my name is John Traves, and I am the Director of Legal Municipal Clerk and External Affairs with the Halifax Regional Municipality, uh, Municipal Solicitor, if you prefer. If this sounds familiar, it's the same opening from yesterday, I think. Uh, or last time. I, I appreciate the opportunity to speak uh, in respect of uh, Bill 201, an act to amend the Municipal Government Act and Halifax Regional Municipality Charter. Um, there's a typo in my, in my remarks. Uh, I'm not here actually in support, unfortunately, um, but I do wish to speak to it. With all due respect, this is not a PACE program, Property Assessed Clean Energy Program. The on-site sewage program is a program of the Nova Scotia Department of Environment, not the municipalities. The property assessed clean energy program is intended to incent homeowners to choose clean energy options when given a choice. Wells and on-site sewage systems are important. They're not a choice. And they don't involve a policy choice of this nature. Adding them to the PACE program simply raises expectations with those who are often most vulnerable. Let me be blunt, if you can't arrange financing on an on-site sewage system from a lending institution, you're probably going to struggle to repay the municipality. And the municipality's only route to deal with this is to lien and sell properties at tax sale. While a program with respect to on-site sewage system is something that municipalities might entertain after consultation and discussion, it's not something the HRM has requested or considered at this time. As you are aware, the Charter legally obliges the Minister to consult with HRM in respect of any proposed changes to the Halifax Regional Municipality Charter. I am aware that the Government's legislative agenda for this fall sitting was set approximately seven months ago, and in that time there has been no consultation or discussions with respect to this proposal. This, despite the concerns raised by HRM with respect to the lack of consultation in 2016 in respect to Bill 62 which added wells to the PACE program, and Bill 177, which created commercial tax districts. On November 22, 2018, Councillor Way Mason, president of NSFM, wrote the minister, attaching a list of the four key statements of municipal concern. A copy of his letter is attached to my submission. The first of those being municipal responsibilities, as Councillor Mason indicated. Municipal costs of policing, fire service, solid waste, water, wastewater treatment have been increasing faster than the consumer price index with municipalities having little control over these costs. And while the province has high demands on its services, these local services are just as important. Without consultation, there is no opportunity for the province and the municipality to reach any common understanding with respect to what is or is not a municipal responsibility on items such as PACE. And more importantly, what is the ability in terms of property taxes to pay for existing responsibilities before being asked to consider taking on additional responsibilities such as funding wells or portions of the provincial on-site sewage program run by the Department of Environment? These sorts of amendments have impacts on municipalities like HRM. Bill 201 will lead to an expectation that HRM will establish a program, staff it, and based on the minister's remarks at second reading, I assume 
funded out of property taxes. So what does Bill 201 not address in the, in the context of consultation? The balance of Council's requests with respect to commercial tax options. Changes to the assessment process to provide for three-year averaging is still outstanding. Council's request regarding inclusionary zoning is not addressed. Affordable housing remains a problem throughout HRM. Most recently, Council's request for changes to allow accessible taxi incentives. The ability for us to provide business grants for vehicle purchase or conversion to assist accessible taxis in, in HRM is not addressed in terms of if we're going to amend the charter and in terms of our desire to have consultation. These are all topics which are priorities for Council and have impacts right across HRM. With all due respect, the Property Assessed Clean Energy Program is not the appropriate vehicle for on-site sewage systems any more than it is for wells, new roofs, driveways, pest control or other private property matters. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Travis. Uh, questions from the committee? I have Mr. McGuire. Thank you for being here today. So, uh, I just, so you, what you're here to say today is that water and sewer is not the responsibility of the municipality. Correct me if I'm wrong. Even, so, and the reason uh, I asked, the reason I asked this is, even when you have multi-level partnerships to run water to community that may uh, have uh, issues with potable water, and the uh, municipality is refusing to. Uh, help those communities, even though those, those communities are inside of HRM and are paying uh, taxes to HRM, what other options are there uh, for those communities? Mr. So Travis. whose responsibility ultimately is water and sewer then? If it's not yours, if it's not Halifax Water, whose is it? Mr. Travis. Uh, Mr. Vice Chair, through you to the member, water and sewer is absolutely a municipal responsibility. And that is provided through Halifax Water and HRM, which establishes service boundaries and sets levels of service, if I may finish in terms of that. You've added on to it in terms of those outside of the service boundary. There is a limit in all municipalities in terms of what can be done. My point today is simply one of which, without consultation, it is difficult to understand how to set up a program which is designed for clean energy and which, quite frankly, um, deals with funding of these sorts of things in the absence of understanding how this accords with the Department of Environment and their on-site sewage program. As the minister said at, at second reading, this is, an, this is an environmental issue. This is not, and environmental issues are provincial issues. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to try and get back to you. I've got three others here, so I'm going to go to Ms. Ch Gender. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would like, uh, in light of the fact that I think that we have heard and will continue to hear the words no consultation throughout the rest of this day, um, and in this bill in particular, I'd like to make a motion to send this bill back to the department for proper consultation with the municipalities. There's a motion on the floor. Any discussion on the motion? All in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Nay. Motion's defeated. Uh, Mr. Jessam. Uh, a couple of things here. I'll try to wrap up into to one. Um, initially, can we get a copy of your remarks, please? Okay, awesome. Uh, additionally, you, uh, you made reference to um, this not being an appropriate place in a, in a clean energy program. If, if it were to be situated somewhere else, can you... Can you better describe that? Mr. Travis. Uh, initially, I would suggest that it, is, it, it be considered as part of the province's on-site sewage program. Um, is, is the municipality and council prepared to have consultations and discussion with respect to a municipal program? Certainly. But it, as I've said, there are a number of challenges um, with respect to calls on property taxes. And so it does come back to a question of who's best uh, equipped to stand up a program such as this and, and to fund it. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Lohr. Um, thank you, Mr. Traves. I'm, I'm kind of, um, and maybe I didn't know enough about what was going on, but I'm kind of surprised to hear that you, you don't want this bill um, 
and you weren't consulted. So I'm wondering who, who does want this bill? What's the driver? And maybe I'm asking you to speculate, but do, do you, what is the background? Why is this bill coming forward? Mr. Travis? I can't speculate. Uh, the reality is the PACE program, I think, was, was um, at the pressing of some municipalities um, amended to put in wells. And so my assumption is, if thought if that was a program, it could be expanded yet again. But, you know, it, I wasn't party to any of the discussions. And I'm informed, I don't believe this was raised with, with uh, Nova Scotia Federation municipalities either, is my understanding. Uh, we're going to have time to get back to Mr. McGuire, so I'll give you one quick follow-up. So, uh, obviously, people within the city part would have municipal sewage. Everyone in the HRM outside of the city would have would have their own on-site sewage. So, would, wouldn't uh, wouldn't the people in the rural parts of HRM benefit from from this uh, bill, Mr. Travis? The challenge is at what cost and in terms of to the municipality and, and really one of whether or not it's necessary. I'm not sure on because if you come back to it, unlike clean energy, uh, which is a choice, whether, whether you pursue solar or whether you stay on you know, traditional um, coal-fired generation, it's, it, we need to incent people to take the right step. Uh, On-site sewage is not a choice. And so, you know, generally speaking, it is dealt with by your lending institution and the, and the private homeowner in terms of assessing that. Our challenge in many ways is if we stand up a program where we're lending, you know, taxpayers' money into this in a program run by, frankly, bureaucrats, the question becomes one, well, you know, what, uh, on what terms and, and in what way does, you know, does the municipality's ability to borrow then take the place of an individual's. Uh, you're starting to, to get into a much larger, larger issue, which I think is part of the problem with trying to stand up a wells program. If somebody drills a well and is unsuccessful and they've been financed by, by the uh, municipality, the question then becomes about ability to repay and, and the ability of the taxpayers to recoup the investment. So it's, it's just part of a bigger discussion around how would we go about doing this and is this the best vehicle? Mr. McGuire. Just quickly, to answer Mr. Lohr's question, taxpayers, people that can't afford, uh, you know, people who need help with uh, potable water and, and sewer. So my question is what happens to residents and individuals and communities when there is consultation? when there is consultation on multiple levels of government and one decides they don't want a partner which stops them from getting potable water. So what options do they have? When, when, the, when a municipality refuses to run water to a community, even though there is money there for that, uh, for the, for that potable water, and it leaves those individuals who are paying taxes, those individuals who are citizens of HRM, and it's not just one community, there's multiple communities it leaves them in a situation where their the the property the property value is decreasing. Uh, there's potential for health issues because of the water that they're dealing with. Um, where do we go? What do we do if there is consultation and, and there's no Ms. reaction? Mr. Travis, look, uh, service boundaries are well established, and, and generally speaking, the issue is when and and at what and at what speed. Can the municipality afford to extend service and in what direction based on planning principles as to where development others will occur? That factors into individuals' decision to purchase their property, the value of the property, any number of things. It's, I'm, I'm not able to debate. The issue is that, frankly, there is a lot to unpack in this bit, which is why it's so important to have some conversations around this before starting down these sorts of roads. If, quite frankly, the answer in some cases is to say, look, for an on-site sewage program where, where it is an environmental issue, arguably it's a question I would throw back at the province to say, well, why are you not undertaking this? Any further questions? Thank you, Mr. Travis. I'm looking for a motion on Bill number 201. Ms. De Constanza. Mr. Chair, I would like to move Bill Number 201, Municipal Government Act Amended, and Halifax Regional Municipality Charter Amended, to back to the House without amendment. Thank you. There's a motion on the floor. All in f any discussion? All in favour, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? 
Motion is carried. Thank you. Uh, next is uh, Bill Number 192, the Municipal Elections Act. Mayor Ma Mike Savage, along with John Travis. Welcome, Your Worship, and welcome back, Mr. Travis. Um, Mayor Travis, uh, we have 15 minutes, 10 minutes for a presentation, up to 10, uh, and then five for questions. Uh, just because I noticed you came in late, I just wanted to make sure you knew the timing. So, Your Worship, uh, the, f the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Chair and uh, Honourable Members. I'm uh value the strong working relationship between the province of Nova Scotia and the Halifax Regional Municipality. And we know that this government recognizes that the strengths of Halifax are indeed the strengths of all Nova Scotia and vice versa. As you consider the slate of amendments before you, please know that we and the government have, you the government have approved other initiatives that council has requested, including making our elections more transparent and fair. We asked for and received the right to bring in more stringent campaign finance requirements. Next year's municipal elections in Halifax will be the first to have meaningful regulation governing campaign contributions and expenditures and duration of campaign activities. I'm making my first appearance at law amendments because I believe Canadian newcomers are making us a better province. The recognition of that contribution to Nova Scotia, in my view, should include the right to vote in municipal elections. I'd like to be clear, I'm not here at the behest of Halifax Regional Council, though Council passed a motion on August the 5th, 2014, to seek legislative amendments to extend municipal voting rights to permanent residents. What Halifax and Nova Scotia need more than anything else continues to be people, to live here, work here, study here, and invest here. In opening this legislation, we have an opportunity to make a progressive change that aligns with our shared desire to grow the population and the economy of our province. With the important exception of the Mi'kmaq people, ours is a city shaped by the hard work of immigrants. From the early settlers to home children, war brides, to waves of people over generations fleeing conflict or seeking better opportunities for their families, we have built today's Halifax, the thriving economic and cultural heart of Atlantic Canada. Halifax, of course, is home to Pier 21, where a million immigrants landed between 1928 and 71, too many of whom quickly headed to more populous cities. But these are different times in our city, and by extension, our province is blessed with new possibilities. We're experiencing population growth and witnessing aging population stats edge back down. For that, we have Canadian newcomers to thank. But we want more of them, and we want to keep them. The Ivany Commission's urgent call to action was clear on this point. Immigration is our future. And we are experiencing its benefits in Halifax and across the province. Population is at an all-time high in Nova Scotia. In Halifax, we've seen three consecutive years of record population growth between 7,000 and 8,500 per year. This growth is largely the result of immigration, some interprovincial, but less so from intra-migration. In short, our growth is not coming at the expense of other communities in Maritime Canada, but internationally. In the second quarter of 2019 alone, this province received 2,124 immigrants, the highest for any quarter since data has been collected. We currently now have got 29,415 permanent residents in the Halifax region. Municipal voting rules are not static. They've evolved over time to include women, First Nations people, and those who don't own property. That's the way it should be. The history of voting rights is about removing arbitrary restrictions on who can vote. Whether you were born in Halifax or came here by another land, municipal government impacts your life. At the city, we are rightly responsible for serving everybody who lives within our boundaries, and the people who choose to live here, in my view, should have a say in the affairs of their city. I don't feel that a Canadian citizen who moves here from, say, Vancouver or Montreal or Toronto and can cast a ballot within six months is necessarily any more knowledgeable or involved in our community than somebody who moves here from outside Canada. As I look around the table, I see people who 
happen to see lots of new Canadians at lots of events, and you know how seriously they take their residency here. But under the Elections Act, a person is not eligible to vote until he or she has obtained Canadian, citizen, Canadian citizenship, which can only be applied for if they're a permanent resident who has lived in the country for a minimum of three years at the last five. Add to that the processing times, throw in a four-year municipal election cycle, and it could take years for people to be welcome at a polling station. And yet, long before they take an oath of Canadian citizenship, permanent residents contribute to our city. They pay taxes, including property taxes, along with fees for municipal programs and transit use. They are our friends, neighbours, coaches, volunteers, entrepreneurs, tradespeople, researchers, and others. Extending the vote sends an important welcoming message to anybody who chooses to live in Halifax. Now, this is not a radical idea. It's been pursued in other cities, Toronto, Vancouver, and has been implemented in many cities and countries around the world. Indeed, according to the Canadian Civil Liberties Association, 45 democracies around the world have extended voting rights to foreigners of varying degrees. Yet, if we act now, we would be the first province in Canada to enshrine this right in legislation. In giving permanent residents the same municipal voting rights as Canadian citizens, we tell them they're needed and their participation is valued in building a more diverse, prosperous and progressive Halifax and Nova Scotia. We say we no longer support the current practice in some cases of taxation without representation. I believe it's time to give voice to the very people we are counting on to help create the economic future of our city and our province. I encourage you to make this very positive amendment to the Municipal Elections Act. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Your Worship. Uh, questions from the committee, Ms. Chender. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you for being here today. Uh, this is something uh, that our colleague from Halifax and Edom has spoken to uh, on the floor of the House, and we are certainly in agreement um, that this would be uh, an important and overdue change, um, particularly as you point out, uh, number one, given the idea that there is no taxation without representation, which I think is an important one, uh, but also was happy to see you raise the issue of uh, how voting rights have been extended over the years because we celebrate the history of the vote, but we know that that history evolves and some people got the vote very, very recently. Um, my question uh, to you, um, given that you're urging us to be the first province in Canada, which I think would be fitting uh, and wonderful, uh, what rule in particular would you propose, um, given your understanding of the municipal elections, that people should have that right right away or that it should be six months? Do you have a more specific amendment in mind? M Mayor Savage. Yes, thank you very much for that. Yes, our, I mean, our plan is that they would be subject to the same rules and regulations as anybody else, which would mean they'd have to be a resident here for six months. Uh, we've been told, our municipal clerk uh, has told us that we could implement this, it wouldn't be stringent, it wouldn't take a huge amount of bureaucracy to do it. And I would make one, one little amendment that I think you'd probably agree with. When I say taxation without representation, I mean that but I don't want people to think that unless you pay taxes, you're not a citizen. There's a lot of people who are not in a position to pay tax who are just as much a citizen as I am. So, but I do think if you come here and do all these other things in our community, uh, you should have the opportunity to vote. You guys can certainly decide if it makes sense provincially, federally. I think there are different reasons at different jurisdictions. But a good place to start would be at the highest order of government, the municipal order. Uh, Mr. Jessen with a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair, through you, Your Worship. Thank you for your time and your uh, willingness to, to be here today. Um, evidently, this is this is a conversation that, you know, I, quite frankly, I've 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 kind of heard about in in passing. I know that is a significant and an important decision, um, one that perhaps warrants more conversation than um, we shall he shall have here today. I'm wondering. Uh, what type of and how much meaningful conversation have has yourself or representatives of the city had with the provincial government to date, considering there's been an emotion passed since 2014, I believe you quoted through the chair. Mr. Mayor. Yeah, thank you for the question. Yeah, this was passed in 2014. It came to council. It was a motion that I brought to council myself, which I don't do that often. Um, I also bought the campaign finance uh, to council as well. Um, 
and it was, it, I don't think it was unanimous to council, but I think it was near unanimous, perhaps one or two councillors um, opposed it. I've had discussions with people, with the Premier, I've had discussions with, at the time, uh, I think it was Minister Fury, uh, certainly with Minister Churchill, I've talked with Minister Diab, who's done so much to promote um, immigration and to the great success of this province. So we've had conversations. We understand that there's a lot of things that are on the legislative agenda and that we can't uh, move everything quickly. I've never been to law amendments before, you know, long time listener, first time caller. But uh, this is one I feel personally uh, that I think uh, I, don't, I, I don't come here today to tell you that if we allow new, new Canadians, permanent residents, to vote in Halifax that we'll have a flock of immigrants coming from, from new countries. I don't suggest that for a second. What I do suggest is it's a rightful way to recognize the contribution that they're making. So we have had a number of conversations with um, ministers. There have been some issues raised. For example, the, one, of the, one of the questions that was first thrown back to me was, well, why would we do it for Halifax and not for all of Nova Scotia? I believe the UNSM Board of Directors endorsed this unanimously back at the time, now the NSFM. So I think that there's, uh, you know, an interest from a lot of people to, to see this go. But I'm not here issuing ultimatums and complaining. I'm just here to say in my heart, as an individual more than anything else, that we owe an awful lot to people who are choosing to come to this province, and I would like to have them vote in the election, even if they vote against me, which is not my intent. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Mr. Holman. You, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, Your Worship. Thank you for being here. Uh, I know this is a, an issue you've been advocating for quite some time. I, I seem to recall a conversation uh, in my classroom many years ago with my students uh, about this very issue. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion to refer this amendment back to the Department for consideration. There's a motion on the floor. Discussion? M Ms. De Costanza. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I'm, as I'm listening to you and you answered part of the question is, it's, it's very difficult for new immigrants to understand the difference between municipal election, uh, provincial election, and Ms. federal. Ms. De Costanza, will, just before we go to that, we yes. have a motion on the floor. Are you speaking oh, to the sorry, motion? No, I, I put my hand out. To speak yeah, before. You're, we're coming to sorry, you. There was a I motion apologize. that snuck in before you. Any discussion on the motion? Ms. Miller. Yeah, just a short word. I'm, I don't want to dismiss this motion, uh, certainly uh, out of hand, but I think that uh, right now we're dealing with the act as it is, and it would take the department a whole lot more conversation and consultation before anything like this could be enacted, so we'll be voting uh, against the motion. Thank you. Any further discussion? Oh, Ms. Gender. Uh, well, I would just like to register my opinion that that's too bad before we all vote and get voted down again. Um, because as I think has been um, shown here, this conversation has been going on for quite some time. The act is now open. Um, this is a simple amendment. Uh, and I don't believe, I believe that we could get this amendment put in. We could get this bill back here the next time we have Committee of the Whole, which we will do again before we rise. And we could get this act passed this session. Thank you. Any further discussion? All in favor? Mr. Mr. Lure? I guess I would like to speak in favor of referring it back to the department and agree with Ms. Chender. I think the, the issue will be giving the municipalities the ability to do this and then the work would be on their side in determining how they enact it. That, that would be the major work with involved. So I'd like to speak in favor of the motion to refer it back to the department. Thank you. Any further? Mr. Jessam. Quickly, I, I'm, I'm comfortable. Uh, moving this forward um, to have the discussion at the departmental level, but what I'm not comfortable doing is holding the bill up in the process um, for this piece. So I can commit that, that I will bring this forward to um, our department, our minister, and uh, but at this point in time, I don't, we're, we're talking about two, two separate things, sir. So um, I'll be voting down the motion so that we can keep this moving forward. Thank you. Ms. LeBlanc. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I just want to uh, reiterate my colleagues' comments that uh, this, is, this would be a very simple um, uh, change to this bill that is currently open in front of us. Now is the time. We're sitting in the legislature for one or two more weeks. Uh, this kind of, you know, um, 
re rejection based on, oh, it's so much work, oh, it would take so much time. We have already done the research. The, this discussion's been going on for a long, long time. Uh, I just, I, I don't buy it. And uh, I was going to uh, propose an amendment before my colleague did, or after my colleague did, uh, just to deal with the amendment right now. Uh, I'm not going to do that, but I want to be on the record by saying that I was about to. Um, and uh, yeah, it doesn't make any sense that we wouldn't uh, listen to uh, the experts that we have here, the mayor of the HRM, uh, and, uh, and just move this forward with the amendment. Ms. Chender. Just one final note that we do have a municipal election coming up. Uh, I believe that making this change now would enfranchise, yeah. I think we saw up to 30,000 voters to vote in the next round of municipal elections, and we would very likely miss that mark if we don't take this opportunity. Uh, so again, speaking in favour of this motion. Great, thank you. I think we've exhausted the comments. All in favour, please signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, nay. Nay. Motion's defeated. Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Worship. You have two seconds. Take a mayor's two seconds. Uh, your Worship. Yeah, no, thank you. I, want to, I appreciate the conversation on both sides. I understand what, what people are saying. I do think anybody, just about everybody around this table has been to a citizenship ceremony, and you can't fail but be impressed by how much they know before they come even to this country. And I think allowing people to vote with that level of interest and passion would be a good thing. Thank you. Thank you once again, Mr. Mayor, for keeping the discussion going. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'd like to actually deal with the two bills that we don't have represent. Are you going to refer this one back? Pardon me? Are you going to refer this one back to the House Amendment 2? Oh, yes, sorry. Yes, sorry. Please go ahead. Do I have a motion for, for bill number 192? Ms. De Costanza. I move that bill 192, Municipal Election Act, amended to be moved back to the House without amendment. Any discussion? All in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion is carried. Uh, I'd like to also deal with uh, bills number 189 and 197. We do not have representation, but we do have uh, staff uh, from the civil service here until these things get through the committee. So if I could get a motion on bill number 189, the House of Assembly Act. Ms. Miller. Yeah, I uh, so move the bill number 189, the House of Assembly Act, be returned uh, to the uh, chamber without amendment. Thank you. Any discussion? All in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you. Could I have a motion on bill number 197? Mr. Jessam. Through you, Mr. Chair, I move that bill 197 be moved back to the House without amendment. Any discussion? All in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you. Okay, so let's now move on to bill number uh, 203, the Crown Attorney's Labor Relations Act. And first up is Mr. Paul Cavalluzzo. Excuse my pronunciation. Well, welcome, uh, Miss, Mr. Cav Cavalluzzo. You're obviously not Italian. Um, <laughs> well, it's, what it's, was your first? What was your first Cavalu hint? <laughs> it's Cavaluzzo. Cavaluzzo. Or Cavaluzzo. Cavaluzzo. I, either is fine. The floor is yours, sir. Thank you. Now, I represent the Nova Scotia Crown Attorneys Association and have done so for uh, a number of years, and we thank you for the opportunity uh, to make this uh, submission. So I, uh, just a, a brief introduction, I am a labor and constitutional lawyer and uh, have been so since 1973 and have argued many cases that, that I'm going to talk about briefly uh, before the Supreme Court of Canada dealing with the Charter of Rights, Collective Bargaining and, uh, and Labor Law. Um, a, a confession up front, I am a lawyer from away and worse, I'm from Toronto, so with that qualification. Now, I want to address bill number uh, 203 from a, both a labor and constitutional perspective, because at this time in our labor and legal history, 
Canadians uh, have the right uh, to bargain collectively. And at the outset, let me say that this presentation is much more important than money because it deals with fundamental constitutional rights of these Crown attorneys. Now, the right to bargain collectively is guaranteed in Section uh, 2D, which protects freedom of association. And what the Supreme Court of Canada has said is what it does, it permits employees to collectively deal uh, with their employer and alleviates the historic inequality uh, between employees and employers. In short, what collective bargaining does, and its main achievement, is to address that historic inequality. Now, an important aspect of the right uh, to collective bargaining is that any kind of process of collective bargaining must be meaningful. And in order, it, in, in order for it to be meaningful, there must be an effective, what's called a dispute settlement mechanism which will resolve bargaining impasses when employers and employees reach that stage. Now, the recent jurisprudence of the Supreme Court of Canada makes that very clear, and there is no question about it. And one of the things that the Supreme Court of Canada has said recently in 2015 is that a legislative scheme that reduces the bargaining power of the employees so that there can be no meaningful bargaining is illegal, as it is contrary to Section 2D. And a red flag for this kind of unlawful action is the unilateral termination of a collective agreement uh, by an employer when it has agreed to that agreement with its employees. Now that brings me, with that general background in mind, brings me to bill number 203. And in my view, and I, I say this without hesitation, bill number 203 is clearly unconstitutional. And what I recommend to this committee in its oversight capacity is that it demand from the Department of Justice the legal opinion that is required in order to ensure that a proposed law is charter compliant. This is required by the charter, and I suggest to you that no such opinion exists. In all of my years of practice, I have never seen such arbitrary action done by a government, particularly in respect of the people who are on the front lines of the criminal courts and play a pivotal role in the administration of justice. Indeed, there is no more important responsibility in the criminal justice system than the exercise of prosecutorial discretion that is exercised every day by these Crown attorneys across the province. Now, in this situation, how did the government treat its Crown attorneys? Did the government give its Crown attorneys the respect and dignity which is required by Section 2D of the Charter of Rights? And in my respectful submission, the answer is a clear no for four reasons. First, the bill rips up a voluntary agreed upon framework agreement that this government agreed to be bound by. Bill number 203 provides that it amends the framework agreement. It doesn't amend the framework agreement, it guts it. It destroys the framework agreement that it agreed to by taking away the effective dispute settlement mechanism that is contained in the agreement. Most Canadians believe that a deal is a deal. What is the point of making an agreement with a government that's not going to keep its word? This is particularly so because in the last round of collective bargaining, the Crown Attorneys Association accepted the offer made by the government on the basis that their framework agreement would be extended. That was the quid pro quo. 
And then what happens in the very next round of bargaining, after the association has relied on the good faith of the government, the government rips up the deal. Whatever happened to that important legal concept called the honor of the crown? Unfortunately, this government's view of collective bargaining is that it's my way or the highway. As I said earlier, a nullification of an agreement is on its face unconstitutional. Second reason we rely on, or I rely on, is that the government changed the rules in the middle of the process. It's like the schoolyard bully who's not getting their way in the game and takes the ball away. And that's what happened in this case. Because Canadians expect fair play. And if you can't get fair play from the government, where are you going to get it? In this case, the Crowns have been bargaining since April, went through the conciliation process, and then now is the time that it would be going to arbitration. There are similar processes and agreements across this country, hundreds. There's nothing novel or radical about their agreement. The only radical thing is for a government to change the rules it agreed to in the middle of the game. Third reason I rely upon is that Section 2D of the Charter requires the government to consult its employees before it does anything which could impact on the collective bargaining process. Two minutes the, remaining. Pardon me? Two minutes remaining. What the government did in this case, it didn't even notify the employees of 203. They had to learn about it from reporters, some consultation. Finally, and the most important reason, is that the government has created a cruel joke in this case with Bill Number 203 because it states that it is giving the Crowns the right to strike. Well, that's an illusory, meaningless right. Because if you look at the essential services definition in Section 3, every Crown attorney in this province is an essential service. And what that means is that the government has given the employees the right to strike, but they can't strike. And what the Supreme Court of Canada has clearly said in that kind of situation, in that kind of situation where you have essential services so that the right to strike is meaningless, every Canadian worker is entitled to the right to arbitration. The law is very, very clear in that regard. So you ask yourself, why is this government determined not to go to arbitration? And the answer is clear, because it feels it has been treating its Crown attorneys unfairly, and it doesn't want to give an arbitrator, an independent arbitrator, the opportunity to provide a fair, reasonable, and just decision. The title of Bill Number 203 is the Crown Attorneys Labor Relations Act. Well, that's a misnomer. What it should be called is the Crown Attorneys Master Servant Law Act because without the collective right to arbitrate, to bargain collectively in a meaningful way, you're back to master-servant law, and I suggest that Nova Scotia is much better than that. Thank, Thank you very you. much, M M Mr. Cavaluzzo. Questions from the committee? Ms. Chender? Uh, thank you for appearing here today, Mr. Cavaluzzo. Thank you for your comments. Uh, I think they were very helpful. Um, I'm interested, um, we agree with you on each point. Um, I'm interested in particular about what you said at the end, um, clearly uh, giving Crown attorneys the right to strike is not what's happening in this case, but you say that the Supreme Court is clear that in these particular circumstances uh, where such illusory right is given that they are entitled to arbitration. Are there specific precedents on that point? Has this happened before? Mr. Cavaluzzo? 
Abs absolutely. And I'm referring to a case called the uh, Saskatchewan Federation of Labor case, Supreme Court of Canada, 2015, where the majority through Justice Abella says that Paul Weiler persuasively explained why such an alternative as arbitration is critical for essential services. And Mr. Weiler, who's the leading academic in Canada on labor relations, he's at Harvard now, he says, if we pull all the teeth of a union by requiring provision of imperative public safety services such that any remaining strike option does not afford the union significant bargaining leverage, then I believe the union should have access to arbitration. And that's a clear direction from the Supreme Court of Canada. Ms. LeBlanc, and then I've got Mr. Lohr with uh, three minutes remaining. Ms. LeBlanc. Thank you very much. Um, I, again, I, I also agree with everything you've said, it's, uh, and you state it so uh, well and um, articulately, so thank you. The one thing I, have, I want to take exception uh, to is your use of the term radical when you talk about this government's uh, actions being radical. Unfortunately, I would have to disagree because uh, in my time involved in politics and before, I have observed this government do very similar things to other public service unions, and so unfortunately, it's becoming a, a very uh, depressing uh, uh, pattern in our province. So, um, but what I was going to ask you is, given that you have so much experience, uh, especially at the Supreme Court of Canada, uh, presumably fighting these types of pieces of legislation, can you tell us, can you extrapolate or look into the future a little bit it, um, about what could happen here to um, to this piece of legislation uh, if the government proceeds with it in terms of, you know, it going to higher courts and how long and how costly that could be for Nova Scotia? Mr. Cavaluzzo. Well, as you know, charter lit litigation takes a long time and is very costly, but I'm very confident that if this uh, bill, if it's not withdrawn and it proceeds, that a court will find it contrary to Section 2D. Very confident because of the recent jurisprudence of the Supreme Court of Canada. I'm very surprised that this government is proceeding with it. It must have its Department of Justice advising it because the Charter of Rights requires that it receive an opinion on every proposed law to ensure that the bill is charter compliant. And I can't believe any lawyer in this country that can spell the word charter would find this law to be constitutional. Mr. Lohr, minute 20. Yeah, uh, thank you. I uh, appreciate your presentation. I'm just wondering if you can, and I presume the Crown Attorneys Association was party or pro involved in the negotiations here. The, I just wonder if you could give us a timeline uh, sort of of the significant events in this uh, negotiation with the government on, on wages and how long it's been going on and when, you, when each step took place. Mr. Cavaluzzo. The bargaining commenced in April of this year. Uh, the parties didn't reach a settlement and under the framework agreement were required to go to conciliation with the conciliation officer of the Ministry of Labor here. That was done. Today we received the report from the Ministry of Labor saying uh, that this is the conciliator's report and under the framework agreement the next step would have been arbitration. And this is what, uh, this is why bill number 203 was passed because the uh, government obviously didn't want to face the Crown Attorneys at arbitration. Uh, we have 20 seconds, Mr. Lohr. So, so I guess, and I think you stated that, how long were you aware that 203 was coming into this uh, from when you, when you saw the conciliator's report? Mr. Cavaluzzo. Uh, I found out about this through the Crown Attorneys Association uh, who learned about it uh, from reporters, and I think they found out about half an hour before it was introduced, which is, to me is just unbelievable. Great. Unbelievable. Thank you very much, Mr. Cavaluzzo try and do better on my Italian next time. Uh, Ms. Uh, McFadgen, Nan McFadgen from CUPE Nova Scotia. Oh, Mr. Cavaluzzo? I get extra time because you misspelled. Welcome, Ms. Ms. Uh, McFadgen. The floor is yours. Thank you. That's a tough act to follow, but I'll do my best. I'm definitely not a lawyer. 
So I'm here today to stand in solidarity with the Crown prosecutors, who are this government's most recent target of anti-worker legislation. The Liberal government's desire to remove interest arbitration, now realizing that arbitration would give the Crown attorneys a decent wage increase, making it difficult for you to maintain your suppression of workers' wages across Nova Scotia. I have no doubt you stand proudly on your record of taking away workers' rights. However, for CUPE in Nova Scotia, what you think of Nova Scotia workers was laid out for us with Bill 19, the Trade Union Act amendments, where you made it more difficult for workers to exercise their rights to unionize. Bill 30, the Essential Home Support Services Act, where during bargaining you removed home support workers' right to strike. Sound familiar? Bill 37, Essential Health and Community Services Act, requiring essential service agreements to be reached or lose the right to strike. How many strikes have there been in Nova Scotia where anyone in the caring profession did not make sure essential needs were met? Oh yeah, none. Bill 1, the Health Authorities Act, restructuring of the healthcare system. Okay, Dorsey caused that one to backfire a bit. It was a direct attack on unionized workers with a view to have some unions decimated. Instead, we have a health care council where unions work together, much to your chagrin. Bill 100, Universities Accountability and Sustainability Act. Legislation that allows universities to enter a five-year period of revitalization where strikes are banned and collective agreements overridden. Bill 148, Public Service Sustainability Act, reaching into collective agreements and taking out existing benefits and legislating wages and terms. Bill 75, Teachers' Professional Agreement and Classroom Improvements. I challenge you to find a teacher to say that they were in agreement with the government legislating a contract. This is not an agreement. You have a history of picking up the legislative pen when you think things won't go your way in bargaining. You have taken the cowardly road where you will not do the work. This anti-worker government can add Bill 203 to the list of legislative attacks on workers. To our collective shame, you got a second mandate. We can only hope it will be your last. Thank you. Questions from the committee? I don't see any questions. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, next, Jason McLean. I think I saw Jason arrive. Mr. McLean, or... Documents are being circulated here. Welcome, Mr. McLean. You have 10 minutes. The floor is yours. I would have wrote a longer speech if I knew I had 10 minutes. So good afternoon, Chairperson and committee members. I'm here today to speak to an unfortunate piece of legislation, the Crown Attorney's Labor Relations Act. My name is Jason McLean, and I'm president of the NSGEU. The NSGU is the largest union in the province representing approximately 31,000 hardworking women and men across the public sector and in provincial government, corrections, public schools, community colleges, universities, municipalities, community organizations, and healthcare. I have to say that I am disappointed to be at law amendments. Once again, to speak against another piece of liberal legislation aimed at stripping public servants of their rights to free and open collective bargaining. This legislation unfairly tilts the balance of power towards the McNeil Liberals and away from hard-working public servants. We know how this kind of strong-arm politics political maneuver played out throughout the public service. It pushed an already vulnerable health care system into chaos. The result, the result is a health care crisis that people now must accept as the new normal. The province can't recruit the number of health care professionals the system needs. How many times do I need to repeat this? Surgeries are cancelled last minute, emergency departments are closed, 
Families are forced to go without a doctor, seniors can't get into long-term care beds, and vulnerable people are left home without the kind of home care that they need. Such political interference in the collective bargaining process puts unnecessary barriers, barriers into recruiting people to come and work in Nova Scotia. Our health care workers continue to be among the lowest paid in Canada, and this government has shown that they are more interested in meddling in the lives of working people than treating them fairly and to allow them to bargain, allow the bargaining process to unfold without interference. I'm disappointed to be here today because lately there has been a lot of good work done in collaboration with government. As a union leader who represents over 30,000 hardworking Nova Scotians, it's clear the Liberal government doesn't believe our collective agreements are worth the paper they're printed on. In November of 2015, then Finance Minister Randy Delory told organized labour in a meeting and in public statements that he wanted to repair public sector labour relations that had been broken far too long. Let me be clear, it wasn't broken. Steve McNeil and the Liberal MLAs sitting around this table broke it. Time and time again, this government has bullied working people without any thought of the, to the consequences. When every problem looks like a nail, the only tool the government will use is a hammer. Don't forget health care is in crisis and vulnerable people continue to suffer at the hands of this government. And now, it's the Crown Attorneys. In 2015, this government agreed to extending the right of arbitration. Now, as the government once again fails to get a deal, they resort, as bullies do, to intimidation and manipulation. Steve McNeil has now changed the rules, broken his own agreement, and has surrendered any credibility that he might have had left with working people. With the fallout of the Jordan decision, the court system is on the brink of crisis, and it is, and as it is, as it did with health care, the actions of the Premier will push it over the edge. The Premier claims he has shown leadership in making tough decisions. Real leadership would be to negotiate in good faith and find compromise, not act like a child who doesn't get his own way and takes his ball and goes home. Real leadership would be to honour the conditions of the existing contract and work in collaboration to find solutions, not legislate away the failures of his government. No one said this would be easy. The fact that the two sides are far apart in the process is part of the process. In the past, that was only a sign that each side needed to work harder. The McNeil process is to ram through legislation to get what he wants. Health care is in crisis. Too bad. We can't recruit health care workers. Too bad. People are leaving the system. Too bad. And now victims won't get the justice they deserve. Well, that's too bad. How can any public servant feel confident that what they bargained for, what this government agreed to, will be honored if things get difficult? If this government can break the terms of contracts, are they sending us a message that we can too? If contracts don't mean anything anymore, I think we might need to reconsider how we do things as well. This, this is a challenge of integrity, a challenge of trust, a challenge of respect. So far, it's a challenge that government has failed. I ask the government members of this committee to tell working people of this province how can they trust this government to protect the benefits and rights they have worked for and depend on? In 2015, Minister Delory told us that he wanted to fix labour relations. If this is government's vision of a fixed system, it's a no wonder why they can't see the crisis in health care or the potential crisis in the justice system. Today, I offer no amendments to the bill, as the bill is a slap in the face to every working person who has a collective agreement in Nova Scotia. The only honourable thing to do is to withdraw the bill and get back to finding solutions, just as we used to do before the Liberals tried to fix labour relations, which weren't actually broken at all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. McLean. Questions from the committee? Ms. LeBlanc. Thank you, Mr. McLean, for being here and offering your um, expert insight into this situation. And, um, you know, um, Yourself and then uh, Ms. McFadden before you uh, gave us lots of examples of, of these sort of uh, terrible labour relations that have been under the auspices of this government. And I'm wondering if you can uh, 
sit back for a second and think about like how it's been and offer a why. Like, can you offer any idea of, as to why you think the government acts in, in this way? Uh, you know, knowing that best practices around the world show that uh, when governments have good labor relations with, with their employees and workers, that, that uh, systems work better. Mr. McLean. Thank you for that question. Um, I've been asking myself uh, that for some time now. So uh, when I look back uh, through the years, uh, and I'll talk about the years that the McNeil government came, came in power, um, right away it, it was a change in relations with government uh, from the previous government to where it was dictatorial. So we had, we had a premier that said, things are going to happen and it's going to happen this way. Well, uh, that is a problem. Uh, we've dealt now with six years of austerity measures from this government. Quite clearly yesterday, uh, Steve McNeil spoke out and he said uh, what he's offering the Crown attorney, attorneys, he's expecting every public servant to, uh, to take that. Well, I'm here today to say that's not happening. We're not having it. You can legislate what you want. I'm telling you, workers in Nova Scotia will take action and I will be firmly behind them to push them to get on the streets, to make noise and to shut this government down. Mr. Mr. Rankin? I, th thank you, Ms. Thank you, uh, Jason, for coming in. I just have a sincere question based on your experience, and I know you've been working at this for a lot longer than I've been in, in the legislature, but I just have a, a question on, from your experience, when a, an agreement is set uh, with a, any bargaining unit in, in government, is it your experience that that pattern is um, expected or generally goes across different collective agreements or different unions? So just from your experience, is that generally the case or is it not the case? Mr. McLean. In, in my experience, there are there is jurisprudence out there of different groups that do set a pattern for the public sector or have set a pattern or have put things out there that other groups could accept as well. Uh, this party in particular isn't one that has set a pattern in the past, nor do we expect them to set a pattern now. Uh, but it's not about that. It's not about a pattern. What it is about is six years of austerity that we're not standing for anymore. So for Mr. McNeil to go out there and say that he expects that, he has, uh, he caught my attention and I hope he's catching my, and I hope I'm getting his right now because we're not having it. So whatever this Liberal government has in terms of legislation, it'll be worth the paper that this government believes that our collective agreements are written on and we won't adhere to them. That's what you need to know. This here is an attack on workers yet again. We've had enough. I've had over 300 of my members in my office in the last three days. I have 150 there today. I had over 100 yesterday, and I had 150 the day before. I told them what was going on here, and I told them we're going to have to take drastic measures if this happens, and they applauded me. They're behind it 100 percent. I will speak with my members, and I do that relentlessly. And, and the problem I have with all this is as well is we've been doing good work with this government since we got over the bills that have happened because we still need to be there to make Nova Scotia a better place. My members, they work their butts off day in, day out to keep the health care system, the broken health care system together, to keep the broken long-term care system together, to keep the broken justice system together, along with the home care system where we have recruitment issues. You can't get people in there. They're keeping it together. But you need to realize you've done damage for six years. To say simply we can't afford, one, betrays them because they deserve a raise because the, pr the price of milk isn't going down. But two, it, it hurts the economy because you've got people able to spend less in their communities. 30,000 members I have across this province, every corner of this province, and every one of them are not happy. And I'm telling you, you guys will see it at the polls, but if a bill comes forward, you will see us in the streets. I guarantee it. Any further questions from the committee? Thank you, Mr. McLean. <coughs> Next, uh, Martin Hirschhorn. Hirschhorn. Thank you. <coughs> it's up to you. Sorry for the mistake on the name. It must be Italian. Um, <laughs> Mr. Hirschhorn, the floor is yours. Thank you. I have some submissions to, to uh, 
distribute, and they're being distributed. Good afternoon. Today, I am here as the Director of Public Prosecutions to voice my grave concerns about Bill 203, which would eliminate the right to binding arbitration for this province's Crown Attorneys. If passed, the bill would be a disaster for the Public Prosecution Service and for Nova Scotia's criminal justice system. Let me tell you why. Our province's Public Prosecution Service was established in 1990 as this country's first independent Public Prosecution Service. Labor relations during those few years were tense. Crown Attorney morale was low. At the core of the problem was the unresolved issue of an independent mechanism to set salaries for Crown Attorneys. Our Crown Attorneys chose to strike. They hit the picket line in 1998. It was a dark time for the Prosecution Service and for the criminal justice system in Nova Scotia. In 2000, under the leadership of then Attorney General, the late Michael Baker, an independent salary setting mechanism was finally established. Since then, we have had a very positive and sustained period of labor relations, the value of which is very hard to calculate, but I can tell you from personal experience, it's real value added. The Nova Scotia Crown Attorneys Association bargained in good faith with the government and the government bargained in good faith with the Crown Attorneys. When an agreement couldn't be reached, the matter went to binding arbitration, which settled on what was fair and proper for both parties. The last negotiated agreement was reached in 2016. The Crown Attorneys accepted the government's pattern wage offer in return for a 30-year framework agreement. 30 years. That agreement is now being violated. As a lawyer, I believe in the principles that agreements must be honoured. I support bargaining in good faith. I support that charter rights must be respected. I trust legal processes like arbitration. Binding arbitration is particularly well suited to an independent organisation like the Public Prosecution Service. As Director of Public Prosecutions, I first heard of this bill on the day it was introduced. I had no opportunity to voice my opinion, one that would have been based on 48 years of experience in the operation of a public service, of a prosecution service. This is disrespectful of my office. I support our Crown Attorneys and the important work they do. I understand their anger with this bill. I'm angry too. I've told them so. As head of the Independent Public Prosecution Service, I stand with them in their opposition to this bill. This bill will designate Crown Attorneys an essential service and will give them the right to strike. The bill is right about one thing. Crowns are an essential service. They are what stands between the people of this province and murderers, child molesters and thieves. But saying Crown Attorneys have the right to strike is meaningless. A strike would bring mayhem to the courts. Public safety would be jeopardized. There's not one Crown Attorney that wouldn't be considered essential. Every day, as it is, we struggle to cover the courts across the province with the 100 Crown Attorneys we have. Crown Attorneys put in countless hours of unpaid overtime. To say this bill confers a right to strike is misleading and disingenuous. What Crown Attorneys, what Crown Attorneys would be able to strike? What murders? sexual assaults or child pornography cases would be left unprosecuted. If Crowns were to strike, government would be forced to contract with the private sector, as was done in 1998. In the private sector, only criminal defence lawyers are experts in criminal law, and they would be in conflict. All the private civil lawyers were able to do in 1998 was adjourn cases. We could get away with that then. Today, in the world of Jordan, cases would be tossed. This service has statutory independence as it relates to prosecution decision making, but it relies on government to decide its funding. There is a line where the decision to fund or not to fund, to approve a request or not, 
affects independence operationally. The potential for a strike by Crown attorneys is very much an operational effect and is one that greatly concerns me. I'm also concerned with the risk to recruitment and retention if salaries do not remain competitive. Nova Scotia currently has a team of first-rate Crown attorneys who want to be compensated fairly and treated with respect. Only an independent salary setting mechanism can ensure this remains the case. Our Crown attorneys are skilled professionals. On Wednesday, I witnessed them receiving the devastating news of this bill as they were settling into a session of continuing legal education. They left to demonstrate their opposition to this bill. And then, being the true professionals that they are, they came back to continue honing their skills as Crown attorneys in the face of this blow to their morale. I thank them for their dedication and their professionalism. In 2000, in announcing the initial framework agreement between the government and the Crown Attorneys Association, Attorney General Michael Baker said this, this is a banner day for the province's public prosecution service. It means a more positive, constructive relationship between the Crown Attorneys and government and provides a solution to the long-standing issue of how wages are set for this independent service. He went on, it's time these individuals and their contributions to the public service be recognized and appreciated. Wise words, which I commend to you today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hershorn. Uh, Mr. Rankin, you have a question? Yes, thank you, Mr. Hershorn. I just wanted to clarify who you're speaking for on behalf of today, if, or if it's just on behalf of yourself. Mr. Hershorn? I speak as the deputy head and the director of public prosecutions, the head of the statutorily created independent prosecution service. Mr. Rankin. Thank you for that. I just wanted to put on the record as a minister of the government that uh, that isn't the position of the province. You don't speak on behalf of the government of Nova Scotia. So I just wanted to make sure that the committee knows that. Mr. Hershorn. Just, it will come on by itself. There we go. I never purported to speak on behalf of the government of Nova Scotia. Do not try to misconstrue my words, please, sir. I spoke as director of the independent, statutorily created by this body, this legislature, the independent public prosecution services country, a well-respected, growing in, in stature both nationally and internationally. And I fervently hope that this legislature doesn't take a step which reverses that, that trend. Ms. Chender. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Hirshhorn, for appearing today. Um, I have a number of questions, but I will stick to this one because I think it's most relevant uh, given this last exchange. Um, we've, heard, we've heard and we've seen and we've been convinced that this uh, is a blow to the independence of the Public Prosecution Service if this bill goes through. I want to ask, because I know you've been in this role for some time, uh, do you see a thread uh, from this action to the case before the Supreme Court now regarding judicial compensation and the bill passed just in the last session around compensation for justice of, of the peace. In each case, the government has stepped in and said that while they will consider advice, uh, they will not be bound by it and they will make the determination themselves. Mr. Hirshhorn. I will not be dragged into a, a discussion about other groups. I, as I indicated, Minister Rankin, I represent the Nova Scotia Public Prosecution Service, a body created by this legislature, and I, uh, I've, been ple I've been privileged and honoured to lead that organization for 19 years. My comments are directed at my, my organization and my staff. Ms. Gender, supplementary. Well, in that case, I'll ask you a follow-up that's specifically directed to the Public Prosecution Service and that touches on something you mentioned. Uh, when I was in the uh, foyer yesterday of Province House, I was approached by someone who identified themselves as working for the Federal Crown, and she said, it's very nice to meet you. It's interesting to hear your opinions on this legislation, and we'll be poaching all of your Crown attorneys now. Uh, do you think uh, that that is an accurate uh, fear that we could have, that, that some of these excellent Crown attorneys, uh, if this legislation goes through, could choose to work elsewhere? 
Mr. Hirshhorn. Absolutely, yes. Uh, Mr. Lohr. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Hirshhorn, for your, your uh, remarks. What I'm wondering about is the constitutionality of the bill. Uh, I think we heard earlier from the Nova Scotia Crown Attorneys Association the, the statement that the, the bill was unconstitutional would be defeated in uh, a challenge, and, and you, I think, maybe almost said that. What, what is your opinion on the constitutionality of this bill? Are charter rights being uh, affected by this bill? Mr. Hirshhorn? While I have a concern, which I voiced in my, op in my remarks uh, in that regard, I am not a constitutional lawyer, and I'm not two days into this matter in a position to, to give you an opinion in that regard. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Hirshhorn. Next is Raymond Larkin. Is Mr. Larkin here yet? Uh, is Paul Wozni here? Okay, we're a little bit ahead of schedule, so I think we all need to take a break for presumably 12 minutes. So uh, we'll reconvene in 12 minutes. Thank you.
Order, please. I'd like peaks, folks to retake their seats and uh, we can continue. Mr. Larkin has uh, arrived. Mr. Lar Larkin, welcome to the table. Uh, my name is Keith Irving. I'm the vice chair. Order, please. Order. Uh, so, Mr. Larkin, we have 15 minutes for you. 10 minute presentation, up to, and then uh, five minutes for questions. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. I, I appreciate the opportunity to come and speak to this bill. Um, I, I uh, have served on uh, arbitration boards on behalf of the Nova Scotia Crown Attorneys Association, three of the four in the, since, 19, since 2000. So I know a bit about the arbitration under that arrangement. And also, members of the committee may know I'm I've been in labor law practice on the trade union side for 43 years and, uh, and actually know a little bit about patterns and pattern settlement. So I wanted to have the chance to express some things tonight and I'm out of breath from running to get here. Um, I, I listened really with interest to the press conference that the Premier gave yesterday and it, it was clear that the objective of Bill 203 was to eliminate the possibility that an arbitrated settlement for these 100 Crown attorneys would create a pattern that then, if it got extended to the whole public sector, would be unaffordable for the province. And uh, I think he argued that quite strongly. But I think mistakenly, I think that the, the, the bill is based on a premise that's not correct. Um, uh, patterns are very important in public sector bargaining, but a pattern uh, in, in which uh, unions and employers agree to follow something that's been uh, determined in relation to uh, another group, um, that can never be set by 100 Crown attorneys. Uh, the pattern settlements have generally, in the public sector, they generally have come up uh, when a large public sector group reaches a settlement. So, for example, the teachers are in collective bargaining now. 10,000 employees. If they make a settlement on salary, then arguably it could be a pattern settlement. Um, uh, the health unions are bargaining next year in 2020, uh, and if they, if they made a settlement, arguably that would create a pattern that would then get followed by everyone else. And the reason everyone else follows it is, of course, once the province has made a settlement with a large group, they insist that, that those numbers be the ones that are used by everyone else. And the other thing is, everyone else accepts that they should be used by anyone else. Uh, a group of 100 employees cannot create a pattern. Um, a pattern can be created by an arbitration settlement. Uh, I don't know if you recall that in December of 2017, the Civil Service Arbitration Board made an award that then actually became the pattern for the rest of the public sector. The health, health unions followed it and all the other contracts are following. And that was, that was a settlement in which uh, rates of pay uh, that came from Bill 148 were embodied. But what was added to it was a payout of the Public Service Award, which was very attractive to employees. So the combination of years going by from 2015 to 2018 and the attractive nature of, of that pattern, of that settlement, just it got accepted by everyone else. That's, that's how pattern settlements work. It's absolutely inconceivable that the Crown attorneys could set a pattern either by bargaining or by arbitration. And the, the reason is kind of obvious. No one would accept that 100 people sh should establish whatever the rates of pay are for 75,000 people. It's just not possible. But it's not possible for a technical reason as well. The salaries of Crown attorneys um, are generally set with an eye to comparability to comparable Crown attorneys in other provinces, in similar provinces. So as I said, I've sat on three of the four arbitration boards that have uh, decided on salaries for Crown attorneys uh, since 2000. And in every one of them, comparability was the issue. Um, and in every one of them, the settlement was superior to the pattern. 
In none of them did the Crown Attorney's arbitration settlement create a pattern that anyone else followed. And you can see why they wouldn't. They wouldn't because someone else to follow it would have to have the same comparables to make a convincing case that it should be followed. And of course, they don't. So it's not just that they're small. 100 people don't set the wages for 75,000. It's that any settlement that they make is not persuasive as a pattern settlement because it's based on other considerations. So the, I, I, I'm not involved in the bargaining of this contract, but I understand there's a difference on pay. And the province has a position they're advancing, and the Crown Attorneys have a position based on comparability with, I don't know, Manitoba and Saskatchewan, or something like that, similar provinces, but Crown Attorneys are paid there. Uh, now, an arbitration board is going to deal with that by assessing the merits of the arguments that are made. And my guess, best guess is that an arbitration board is going to be convinced by the comparability, to some degree. And you'll get, a, you'll get an award that isn't exactly what the province wants, this 1.5% increases in the, in the last two years. But that's not going to affect any other bargaining. They simply cannot set a pattern just because of the nature of their pay, but also uh, this, their size. So, because the premise of Bill 203 is, is faulty, it kind of explains the, the nature of the bill, which is inherently contradictory. And I'm sure you've heard this from everyone else. You've got, let me find this section. Um, Schedule B amends the agreement between the Crown Attorneys Association and the province to recognize a, a strike by Crown Attorneys. And then you have Section 12 that prohibits a strike by Crown Attorneys except in accordance with uh, an agreement to provide essential services. And if any of you have in hand my written submission, I've quoted from uh, Section 3B of the Act where essential service is defined. And I think it is important, particularly as a Law Amendments Committee, in the sense you may find amendments that are suitable. Um, essential service means a service, facility, or activity of the government that is, will be, or at any time necessary for, and then there's the safety and security of the public, protection of rights under the Charter of Rights, and the administration of justice. Every single thing that Crown Attorneys do are necessary for the administration of justice. You take the sentence, you, there's all these ors, but if, if something is necessary for the administration of justice, it's an essential service. That's all they do. 100% of them, that's all they do, is the administration of justice. It couldn't be more sweeping uh, a definition of essential services. And under A, a service that is necessary for the safety and security of the public. Again, it's hard to imagine much of what the Crown Attorneys do that isn't necessary for the safety and security of the public. They're dealing with the enforcement of the law in a fair way against people who commit crimes against other people or against property. And that process of, in the justice system is fundamental to the safety and security of all of us. And that's all Crown Attorneys do. And two minutes. The, uh, and, sorry. Two minutes. I've got two minutes left? Oh, I always take too much time. So, and then the third thing is the protection of the rights under the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And again, I, I don't know that Crown Attorneys do anything else because their duty is not just to win cases, but to see justice is done. So, the definition of essential service is broad enough that on the one hand, the, the bill would give Crown Attorneys the right to strike, and on the other hand, they would completely take it away from them. Now, if I'm wrong on that, there's clearly only a handful of Crown Attorneys who would be permitted to work during a strike. I can imagine, for example, the government might shut down the courthouses in several places and therefore make it possible not to have full staffing. They might do that. If they did that, there'd be some Crown Attorneys that would be at work. And I wasn't here to hear the Director of Public Prosecutions, but I, I'm guessing that he would tell you there is no fat in the administration of justice system that would allow them basically to deliver what's required here without their full staffing. Now, at any given time, there's Crown Attorneys on vacation, so maybe there's a little wiggle room in that, but a handful of, of, um, of Crown Attorneys uh, only would be allowed to strike, and it wouldn't be a meaningful right to strike. Which leads me to the, my last point. If you look on the last page, one of the really glaring things about this act 
uh, that struck me is that it doesn't have in it what the province put in the Essential Health and Community Services Act. The Essential Health and Services Act, in order to make that essential services uh, scheme constitutionally valid, put in this provision that you see that's quoted there, and it gives the Labour Board the ability to decide that an essential services agreement deprives the employees in the bargaining unit of a meaningful right to strike, and then gives the Labour Board a bunch of options on what to do, and one of them is arbitration. Now, the fact that that's not there tells you that there's no intention in this legislation to actually uh, give Crown attorneys any kind of collective bargaining rights. Thank you very Thank much, you. Mr. Larkin. Questions? Ms. Chender. Uh, thank you, Mr. Larkin. I, I want to pick up on that last point just for clarity. Uh, we heard from Mr. Cavaluzzo, who presented first on this bill, um, who referred specifically to a case, um, the, Sas the Saskatchewan Federation of Labour case. So I would, as it sounds to me like this section 15.1 responds directly to that principle from the Supreme Court of Canada. Is that accurate? M Mr. Larkin? Yes, it, it was put in there for that very purpose, to be compliant with what the Supreme Court decided in Saskatchewan Federation of Labor, which was, if too many people are essential, you have to give them a neutral third prop, uh, way to solve the dispute. And Ms. Chender on a supplementary. And so the other thing um, that he raised, which I'll um, put to you, is um, his uh, thesis was that without something like this, there's no way that this bill could be considered charter compliant. Is that also your uh, read of this bill? Mr. Larkin? I would say any lawyer that's familiar with the area would say it's not charter compliant. Uh, and that's kind of what makes it unfair. To challenge this, it'll take years of litigation. It'll cost a fortune. Uh, like I tell clients, if you're going to challenge the constitutional provision, be prepared to spend $500,000. These 100 people don't have $500,000. It's just oppressive. It's an abuse of power, in my view. Mr. Lohr. Uh, th thank you for your presentation. I was really uh, on the, the same line of thought that this bill is not charter compliant. So I, I guess. Uh, and that's what I was wanting to ask you, and I think we heard that from another presenter already here today. Uh, what, what is your opinion about the, the fact that this is a unilateral breaking of an agreement made in 2015? What, uh, is that also a factor in, the, in it not being charter compliant? Mr. Larkin? Yeah, I think there's a bunch of things. There was no consultation for one thing, which is a constitutional requirement. You know, it's just dropped it in the, in the House here. Um, and. I, I think in looking at whether something is a significant interference with collective bargaining, which is the question under the Charter, that the fact that in the last round of bargaining, the Crown attorneys agreed to the Bill 148 numbers before there was Bill 148, in exchange for 30 years of the, the arbitration framework agreement, I mean, that's fundamentally unfair. It's, I, I'm, I, I don't know, I can't see how the province actually could could do this. Um, and so I think a judge is going to have the same reaction. But unfortunately, litigation, it's be be far better if this committee figured out a way to amend this legislation to make it fair than it would be to leave the, uh, these Crown attorneys fighting in the courts for years. Any further questions? Thank you, Mr. Larkin. And our final witness today is uh, Mr. Wozni. Mr. Wasi, I'm, I'm not sure if you heard my instructions to the previous witness, but it's a total of 15 minutes. You have up to 10 minutes for a presentation, followed by questions. And I'll try and give you a signal at two minutes. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, committee members, for this opportunity to speak. Uh, by way of introduction, my name is Paul Wozni. I am a public school teacher, father of three children attending public schools, and president of the Nova Scotia Teachers Union. I'm here on behalf of 9,000 teachers to condemn Bill 203, the Crown Attorney's Labour Relations Act. Bill 203 is fundamentally unfair and should have us all asking, can Nova Scotians trust this government? When this government makes a deal, enters a contract, gives a promise, can we trust them? 
Crown attorneys and government made a deal, a contract. As part of that contract, government promised Crown attorneys binding interest arbitration. Government received a benefit in exchange for that promise, an agreement to the government's desired wage pattern. Now in the very next round of bargaining, government has reneged on that deal. The government says yes, but we're giving them the right to strike. Can we take the government at their word? I'm not a lawyer, but when I read the definition of essential service in Section 3B of the bill, it seems like every Crown attorney will be deemed an essential service under this Act. Essential services means a service, facility or activity of the government that is or will be at any time necessary for I, the safety or security of the public or a segment of the public, I, I, the protection of the rights under the Canadian Charter, the rights and freedoms of persons charged with an offence or triple I, the administration of justice, including the provision of pre-sentencing and post-sentencing reports and other advice. What Crown Attorney does work that isn't necessary for those things? For the safety or security of the public, for the protection of the charter rights of accused persons, for the administration of justice? What Crown Attorney will be permitted to strike under this bill? Can we trust this government when they say that this bill gives Crown Attorneys the right to strike? And even if a few will be allowed to strike, how effective will that strike be? And if no Crown attorneys are allowed to strike, or so few that a strike will be ineffective, how will they be able to press their demands for better pay and better working conditions? Can we trust this government? Teachers have had our own trust issues with government. Bill 75 imposed a collective agreement on us that we did not want. It ended our strike action. It forever prohibits teachers from engaging in strike action that keeps students in classrooms. Does this government really believe in the right to strike? In negotiations, government promised they wouldn't pursue their action plan, part of which including removing administrators from the union. And the, the, the then Minister of Education then publicly announced that she would be pursuing the action plan. Bill 72 forcibly removed administrators from the union. In negotiations, government raised Bill 148 time and again. Now that we're before the courts in a charter challenge to Bill 75, government is telling the courts, Bill 148 never applied to teachers. It was all in our heads. Can we trust this government? Government has told us, the Nova Scotia Teachers Union, don't worry, this bill isn't about you. It's about Crown attorneys. Then the Premier told reporters yesterday that the bill was necessary because it would set a pattern for all civil servants. Every day, teachers are expected to go into the classroom and instill important values in our students, values that include integrity, trust, fairness, and respect. In the teaching standards that this government expects teachers to adhere to, we are expected to, quote unquote, model professionalism characterized by integrity, honesty, trust, and respect. What does it say to the youth of Nova Scotia if their government fails to act with integrity, honesty, trust, and respect. Since I have had the privilege of starting my role as President of the Nova Scotia Teachers Union in 2018, I have been working hard on behalf of teachers to rebuild our relationship with the government, as I believe that it is in the best interests of teachers and students. The NSTU has been engaged in good faith bargaining with the government since the spring, and talks have been constructive. The government has demonstrated by its action that it also wants to move forward in a positive way with teachers. It's been tough given what we went through in the last round of negotiations, but we are engaging in this process in good faith. It will be up to the government to demonstrate whether it can be trusted or whether it will again use the heavy hand of legislation to impose its will on public sector workers, including teachers. Nova Scotia teachers stand in solidarity with Crown attorneys. They made a deal in good faith with government to have binding arbitration to fairly and impartially settle their terms and conditions of work. Government received a benefit in return for the promise of binding arbitration. But as soon as the Crown attorneys wanted to use it, government is now trying to yank it away. What kind of example does that set for Nova Scotians? For our students. Will the government honour its word? Will it demonstrate integrity? Can they be trusted again? They can if they table Bill 203, engage in good faith bargaining with Crown attorneys, and allow a fair and impartial arbitration board to settle this dispute. 
Nova Scotia's teachers and Nova Scotia's youth will be watching. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wozni. Questions? Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Chender. I'd like to make a motion uh, to send this bill back to the department. We have heard today uh, and yesterday that, and the day before that that this bill is unconstitutional, that the framing of this bill is disingenuous, that the idea that Crown uh, have the right to strike is a fallacy, that this is an abuse of legislative power. Um, and we haven't just heard this uh, from those of us uh, accustomed to saying these things on a fairly regular basis, but we've heard this from uh, the foremost expert uh, on this type of law in the country. We've heard this from the Director of Public Prosecutions, whose presence in this chamber today is unprecedented. We've heard this from the uh, singular authoritative voices. There is no way, based on what we've heard, that this bill is compliant with the Charter. And so this government has a choice at this moment to forge ahead and force yet another group of public sector employees into costly litigation, which they will almost certainly win, or it has the opportunity to send it back to the department for further thinking. Any further discussion on the motion? Mr. Delore? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, and I, I was wanting to make the similar motion, so I do want to speak in favor of the uh, motion. Uh, what uh, and and maybe re reiterate the same points. We've had three uh, expert lawyers uh, present to us today, and bo all three express various uh, parts of uh, an opinion that the bill is not charter compliant. So. Uh, along with the motion going back to the department, I would like to see us have a written legal opinion from the Justice Department on the uh, charter status of the bill rather than have the province uh, go forward with the bill and uh, face uh, a long round of uh, a charter challenge, which knowing uh, the group that we're dealing with, the Crown attorneys, who are, I'm sure are very familiar with being in court, would probably not hesitate as a group to do this. If any group in the province would know how to do it, they would know how. Uh, and uh, so I think that we're, we're going down a path here which is, is not a good one for our province right now. I think this is a misguided uh, bill. It seems to be that from what we're hearing from the experts. So I, I would speak in favour of the uh, motion and further request that we need a legal opinion from the Justice Department in writing that uh, on the constitutionality of this uh, bill. You, you want to amend your motion? Okay. Do you want to restate your motion? Ms. Chender? So I'd like to restate my motion to send this back to committee uh, and to have a written opinion from the Justice Department on its charter compliance before the bill moves forward. Thank you. Any further discussion? All in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, nay? Nay. nay. Motion's defeated. Could I have a motion with respect? Could I have a motion <coughs> with respect to 203? Ms. Di Costanzo. I move that Bill 203, Crown Attorneys Labour Relations Act, to be moved uh, to be sent back to the House without amendments. Any discussion? All in favour, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motions carried. That concludes our law amendments meeting. Thank you very much. Mo uh, meetings adjourned. <laughs>